Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 22. And uh, nothing but a great warm-up for a message of seeing some people getting water baptized. It doesn't get any better than that. That's awesome. Love it, love it, love it. So Acts 22, hopefully you're there. And let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Um, let's just all ready for the testimony of those that got water baptized this morning. What a blessing to stand up and testify that you have saved them and they want to walk for you and grow in you. Lord, that's the prayer for all of us here. That's why we're here this morning. That's why we've opened up your word. And we thank you for the adventure that we've been on going through the book of Acts. We pray again this morning you would speak to each of us, speak to us collectively of what we should be doing as a church, certainly sharing the gospel as Paul does here, but also as individuals. Perhaps there is something specific you want to speak to us about, and we want to be open to that every time we come into your house. So we invite you here, Holy Spirit, speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name, we all say amen. So we're on the journey, uh, of course we're nearing the end as we're going to be beginning chapter 22 this morning, and we're going to cover it in its entirety, it's all one flow of thought, and uh, hopefully you've been, I'm just curious, how many of you have been here since the beginning of Acts? Wow, that's awesome, that's a lot of you. And uh, if you weren't, you could always get back, listen to the messages. This is such a great book, and it's really the blueprint of what God wants to see in his church today. And I think we'll see that again this morning. So um, as we noted, if you would take note of this, chapter 21 and verse 33, this really marks the imprisonment of the Apostle Paul. He's there uh, chained, and now he becomes a prisoner. He's a prisoner of Rome all the way to the end of the book. But a reminder, Paul never saw his imprisonment as a setback, but as an opportunity. In fact, he writes in Ephesians 6.20, I'm an ambassador in chains. He saw it as the opportunity, as a launching pad, as a divine appointment from God. And so even though he was always in conflicts, as we'll see again today, he uses it to be courageous and share the gospel. Now, this is something, by the way, just by way of introduction, we see throughout the scriptures. God's people always courageous, trusting God. I think of Nehemiah. If you've never read the book or studied, it's a great book on leadership, by the way. But God calls Nehemiah to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem destroyed by the Babylonians. He gets there, and there's so much opposition again and again, people threatening his life, seeking to attack them and stop them from building the walls. But he's there courageously standing up for the Lord, and God does this miraculous work through all all the people unifying them. Beautiful, beautiful study. God does that when we're courageous. Or how about Daniel? We're familiar with him. He's told, don't pray anymore, Daniel. He was in Babylonian captivity. He says, I'm going to pray. I'm going to obey the Lord. And so he goes to his room, he prays, and he's arrested, and he's thrown into a lion's den. And though he had courage, well, how would it be now? Throw me in, I'm good. And God was good. God protected him. And then I think of Daniel's three friends, Rack, Shack, and Benny. Remember those three? And they're told, you know, listen, Nebuchadnezzar makes this huge statue, 90 feet tall. The guy was an egomaniac, right? And when I play my worship music, everybody's got to bow down before me. And everybody did, except for these three Hebrew teenagers. They said, we're not going to bow. God told us, have no other gods before him. And so they get a second chance. They're put in front of this fiery furnace. If you don't bow down, you're going to be thrown in. They said, hey, whatever God wants to do, but we're not going to bow. And listen, that's a truth for us there. If you don't bow, you won't burn. You don't bow, if you'll bow before Jesus Christ, eventually you won't burn. You'll be in heaven. Amen to that. So what happened? Those three guys thrown in and the Lord was with them and protected them. God is always good when we stand up with a courageous faith. And we're gonna see that again this morning in the midst of this chaos and conflict. Uh, here is Paul. He's resolute. And so I've entitled our message today, Courage in conflict, we see Paul's endearing character. Now, there are four movements here. We put it there in your outline for you this morning. We're gonna see his commitment. We'll see the conversion. He shares his conversion again, which is great. We see his commissioning, and then we're gonna see a conflict, no surprise, once again. Now, we begin with the commitment. This is the first five verses, and again, we're gonna have to kind of set the scene again because Paul here begins addressing a large crowd. And why was this crowd here? Well, Paul has arrived in Jerusalem, <clears throat> and uh, he's arrived at Pentecost, and he's brought a love gift to kind of bring unity between the Gentile Christians and the Jewish believers. And so what happened, he arrives in Jerusalem, and he gathers together with four other Jewish believers to go into the temple to somehow bring this unity. And you can study what we looked at last week. But the point is this, he's in the temple area, and while he's in there, 
some unbelieving Jews from Ephesus, from Asia Minor, who couldn't stand Paul, see Paul there. Now, if you remember, when Paul was in Ephesus, they were so upset with Paul. I mean, he brought an end to idolatry almost. They were going out of business trying to make idols because everybody's converting to Christianity. So they got a mob together. They gathered everybody in the arena, and they wanted to kill Paul, and Paul had to escape. So now Paul's in Jerusalem, and they arrive for the feast as well. They see Paul in the temple, and they go, this is our chance. We're going to get that guy. And so in chapter 21 and verse 28, they said this about Paul. They said to the crowd in the temple, men of Israel, help this man, this Paul guy. He teaches all men everywhere against the people. He's against Jews and he's against the law and this place. He can't stand the temple. Furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Now that's, that's the best way you could ever stir up a Jew. That's like going to a biker convention and saying, hey, this guy over here, he hates Harleys. He hates guys that ride Harleys, rides Harleys, and he hates going places where they go. That guy ain't gonna live very long, right? So they get so upset with Paul and, and they try to kill him. They're so zealous because they are told that Paul supposedly brought a Gentile into the temple, of course, which against the law. So they grab Paul, they shut the doors behind him, and they begin to beat him up. And they were planning on killing him. But as they were pummeling him, we saw this in chapter 21, the garrison which is there, the Romans see this happening. Troops are dispatched, and now even the commander comes down. And they assume, of course, they rescue Paul, just inches from his life being taken from him, and they assume that he's guilty, so they bind him, and they're going to take him to prison. And as they're leading him up the stairs to go into the prison to the Antonio Fortress, Paul asks the commander, do you mind if I address the people? And we talked about last time, listen, if I'm Paul, I'm just saying, arrest me, get me out of here. These guys want to kill me. But Paul wants to address the people. Why? Because Paul sees this large crowd as a group of people going into a timeless eternity without Christ. And he loves the Jewish people, his own people, and he wants to you know, share Jesus one more time with them. So the commander gave him permission, and that's where we find ourselves this morning. He's addressing the crowd. So verse one, he says, men, brethren, and fathers, hear my defense before you now. By the way, the word defense is the Greek word apologia. Uh, we get our theological term apologetics from it. So uh, the study of apologetics is studying the principles that help us defend our faith defend Christianity, even to prove Christianity. So this is Paul, he's giving a defense and he wants to prove that Jesus is the Christ. So Paul is now going to be sharing his testimony. By the way, let me say this, Paul of course would always use God's word. Every time he went to the new cities, he would first go to the synagogue, he would open up the scriptures and share the word of God showing that Jesus is the Messiah. But there was also times where Paul would share his personal testimony, how he came to the Lord. That's what he's going to do here. And one thing I've found, there are many times when we share our faith, you know, well, first of all, sometimes we'll use the Bible, and I use the Bible quite a bit. But sometimes people want to argue, well, you're, you're quoting the scriptures. How do we know if that's the right translation or how long has it been around? But one thing people can't argue with you about, and that's your personal testimony, one thing that people can't argue with. I mean, so I, I think of John chapter nine. In John chapter nine, Jesus healed a blind man. And Jesus then takes off and the Pharisees were all over that. They're asking the blind man, how did this happen? Who did it? And they were arguing with the guy and they were wanting to, him to answer all these philosophical and theological questions. And you know what the blind man said? This is what he said, Listen, I, can't, I don't know the answers to your questions, but one thing I do know. Once I was blind, but now I see. That was his personal testimony. And they couldn't argue that. Here was a man whose life was changed. So this is a great opportunity for us to remind ourselves how we should use our testimony. Now, Paul used and shared his testimony five times in the scriptures. We see it in Acts chapter nine. We'll make reference to that this morning. Acts chapter 26. He shares it in Philippians chapter three and in 1 Timothy chapter one. And then, of course, in this passage here. And let me say, there's great value, as I just mentioned, in you sharing your testimony. I'm a sports fan. I'm a Houston sports fan. Loves all, love all of our sports teams. And I remember back in the 90s when, our, when the Rockets won two NBA championships. That was a big time. We haven't done anything for 20 years since then, but hey, 
We're still like that. And I remember, and it's quoted all the time at playoffs, Rudy Tomjanovich, who was our head coach, said this famous quote, they'll quote it all the time, never underestimate the heart of a champion. I would like to rephrase that, and I would say this, never underestimate the power of your testimony. Your testimony is powerful because they can argue all kinds of things, but they can't argue a changed life. So Paul begins by sharing his past and his testimony in the first five verses, what we would call his BC days. You know what your BC days are, right? That's before Christ. So he begins with addressing his past. By the way, again, notice how he addresses the crowd. Again, verse one, he says, men, brethren, and fathers. I mean, he could address the crowd saying, hey, you guys, you just tried to kill me. What are you thinking? You know, he could have slammed them, but instead of, that he uses enduring terms. He wants to gain their attention. And when they heard that, he spoke to them in Hebrew language, verse two, and they kept all the more silent. So Paul you know, was earlier speaking to the commander in the Greek language, and now he addresses these Jewish people in the Hebrew language. And let me just stop right here and say this. I think this is important. Important, certainly, in sharing our testimony. When you're sharing your testimony, speak Hebrew. No, I'm just kidding, that's not. <laughs> but when you share your testimony, share on the level in which they're at. When Paul spoke to Gentiles, he spoke to them in a way that they would understand. When he spoke to the Jews, of course, not just the Hebrew language, but he would speak to them in things that they were dealing with. When he spoke to scholars, he was a highly educated man. He would speak in those terms. And it would be different on various levels. Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians 9, 22. I've become all things to all men that I might by any means save some. So it's important that we always know our audience and try to address where they're at. Uh, we just can't just, you know, well, let me put it this way. Many people in our church speak different languages. We have some 50 countries represented in our church. So some of you speak Swahili, some speak uh, Chinese, Spanish, you know. And if you were trying to communicate in that language, we wouldn't understand you. But you know what? Sometimes we as Christians speak what I would call Christianese. You know what I'm talking about? You might be sharing your testimony with someone and say, hey man, I just want to talk to you. And you say, you know, when I was in the world, I used to, and they're looking at, what do you mean when you used to be in the world? We're living right now, we're in the world. See, I'm using Christianese. I'm talking about, you know, using Christian language. I was in the world and I'm not of the world. You know? So sometimes we do that in our language. So we always need to take note of that when we're sharing our faith and certainly try to build a bridge to our audience. And certainly that doesn't mean we water down anything at all. But Paul is now seeking to build a bridge to his Jewish brothers. He's speaking their language literally in Hebrew, but also speaking things that they would identify. So notice verse three, he says, I indeed, I'm a Jew. I was born in Tarsus of Cilicia. So I was born just north of here, guys. And by the way, I was brought up in this city, and he's referring to Jerusalem, at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law. So Paul, though he was raised in another city, he was brought here as a young man, and he was in a rabbinical school, schooled by Gamaliel. Now, everybody knows Gamaliel. He was the most famous rabbi at that time, and still is one of the most famous rabbis in Jewish history. And, and the fact is, rabbis chose their students, not students, the rabbi. So he was personally picked by Gamaliel. Imagine that, he was a revered man. So Paul says, you know, I, I was raised and schooled by this guy, according to the strictness of our father's law. We know that Paul eventually actually became a Pharisee. He was catechized according to the historic strictness, an extreme legalist. And he adds, I was zealous toward God as you all are today. So he's saying, I see your zeal. I, he's actually saying, I understand why you tried to kill me. I get that, because that's how zealous I was. Notice he adds verse four, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. Now, you wanna note that term way, this way. We've noted it before, but if you've never seen that before, it's important. This is the term by which believers were identified first before they were called Christians. Christians called themselves the way. And why is that? Well, John 14, six, Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. 
The only way to God is through Jesus. It's not through any other means to heaven. There's no other way that men can be saved. Not through Muhammad, not through uh, you know, Hinduism, Buddhism, no other religion, only Christ alone. In fact, Jesus put it pretty simply. There are two roads. There's a narrow road that leads to life, and there's a broad road that leads to destruction. People say, well, that sounds very narrow-minded. Narrow it is. I'll tell you what, if there's only one way to heaven, I want to be on that path, my friend. I truly do. Peter said in Acts 4.12, speaking of Jesus, neither is there salvation in any other. The Bible makes it very clear. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's only one way. So Christians identify themselves as the way. So notice what Paul says, I persecuted the way. I persecuted Christians. How severely? He says, till death. So Paul was definitely zealous for the law. Anybody that came against the law, I put them to death. By the way, if you think about it, that's exactly what these people were trying to do to Paul. Paul says, I know where you're coming from. I can identify with you. He actually adds in verse five, also the high priest bears me witness. Most likely the high priest was there in this crowd. So you can ask him. He knows, I know the high priest well, well. He's the one that commissioned me to go out as well as the council of the elders, that's the 70 men that comprised the Sanhedrin, from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. So these guys, ask them. Ask them how zealous I was. I got letters, and I got letters to actually leave Jerusalem. I went to Damascus to actually arrest Christians, bring them back to Jerusalem, put them on trial, and put them to death. So <laughs> Paul was pretty radical, right? Paul writes about this again in Galatians chapter one and verse 13. He writes to them and says, you've heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the tradition of my father's. So here in the first five verses, Paul is launching into his testimony and he talks and he starts with his BC days. By the way, let me say this just in regard to sharing his testimony. I love the fact that he doesn't spend much time on the past. He gives a little bit of time. He's gonna talk a whole lot more about the future. And I say that because sometimes when you hear people share their testimonies today, I've heard many people share their testimony. And sometimes, let's say if it's 30 minutes, they spend 25 minutes talking about their sordid past. You know, and then I was an alcoholic and then I did this drug deal. I gotta tell you about this one thing I did over here. Oh, and then I was doing this and I, oh, I did that. And, and you're, you know, you find yourself in this, this you know, horrible, uh, it's an ugly scene, you know. And then they talk about that for 25 minutes and say, and then I gave my life to Jesus and everything's better. Thank you so much. And I'm like... I wanna hear more about what Jesus has done in your life. I don't need to be brought down to the trash can, you know, because that was my life. I simply say that is when you share your testimony, I would say at least share just as much about what Jesus has done after you're saved than prior to. Because I think about what the Lord has done after being saved, and my goodness, I have so much to talk about. And that, to me, gives people hope and encouragement. So here Paul shares a little bit of his past, what he did. And he's building again that bridge with his audience. But here you see his commitment. He was committed to the Lord. When he was a Jew, he was com completely committed. Now that he's a Christian, completely committed. And he was committed to share his faith at this moment. Now let's move on then. And he talks about his conversion in verses six through 13, our second point. Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus, about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. Now, again, we studied this in great detail in Acts chapter 9, but we know the story. Paul is now on the road to Damascus, which is in Syria. He's going to arrest Christians and then bring them back to Jerusalem to be uh, arrested and killed. And uh, by the way, let me say this. In one sense, though the circumstances are different in our life, the process is somewhat the same. Before we come to Christ, we're on a road doing our own thing, the way we want to do it, how we want to do it. And the Lord graciously interrupts our life. He interrupts our life if through different circumstances, maybe through a challenge, through a difficulty, or he brings someone in our life to share uh, their faith. Either way, God is the one who first intervenes in our life. 
It tells us that in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19. It says this, we love him because he what? First loved us. Jesus is the one who begins the process. He's the one on a search and rescue mission for us. So though Paul is on the road to Damascus, Christ has a plan. He interrupted his life, a divine interruption, and God does that with us. So it says, suddenly there was a great light from heaven that shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, I always love this passage because who is Paul persecuting? Who is Paul pulling out of their homes at night and dragging them out to be arrested? It's the Christians, right? And yet Jesus is saying to Paul, why are you persecuting me? I love that. See, in Matthew 25 and verse 40, Jesus said this. He said, inasmuch is you, if you do it unto the least of these people, my brother, anything you do to my kids, you do it to me. Now that goes both ways, both good and, and bad. First of all, when we do something for somebody else to help them, someone in need, we help them. Or we come to someone's aid and we comfort them. We're doing, and we're doing that for them. We're doing that to the Lord. And God sees that and God is blessed by that. But if we do things against God's kids to bring them down to cause harm, Jesus sees that as well. In fact, God says it this way in Zechariah 2.8. He who touches you, if someone touches you, they're touching the apple of my eye. Now think about this. Now the apple of the eye would be considered the pupil of the eye. And God says, when someone does something to my kids, it's like poking me in the eye. And God doesn't like that. You get that idea? So Jesus is saying, Paul, why are you poking me in the eye? Why are you persecuting me? So I answered verse eight, who are you, Lord? By the way, Paul wants to make sure who is uh, his audience, he's talking to me, who this is. Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. So notice Paul has moved his audience from talking about the past, and he now is introducing Jesus. And notice very specifically, he says, Jesus of Nazareth. That's specific. Why? Well, because there's, Jesus was a popular name back then. And he wants every, his audience to know, this is Jesus of Nazareth. And he, here's the one. Everybody knows who Jesus of Nazareth is. Everybody who's assembled here, the Sanhedrin, the high priest, and everybody knows that Jesus of Nazareth was crucified by the Romans, hung on a cross. They know of the whole trial, and, and Jesus rose from the dead, and the whole thing that went along with that, the lies sent out and everything. So Paul continues, verse nine. Now, those who were with me when I was you know, on the road to Damascus, indeed saw this bright light. And they were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. Now, just a footnote for those of you who are Bible students. In the account in Acts chapter 9, it tells us there in verse 7 that the men who journeyed with Paul did hear a voice, but saw no one. But here we read that they, they, they didn't hear a voice. So which is it? Is there a contradiction? Well, the idea is this. They heard a voice, they heard a sound, but they didn't hear the actual words or articulation. Whether they heard some mumbling sound or they heard most likely a crash, a thunder, or whatever it is, they heard sound, but they didn't hear the specifics. So those who were with Paul saw light, they heard some kind of noise, but didn't hear the conversation. And Paul tells us in verse 10, so I said, what shall I do, Lord? So Jesus of Nazareth has you know, apprehended interrupted divinely Paul's life. And the first thing he says, what do I do, Lord? That's the right response. That's what you do when Jesus is your Lord. If Jesus is your Lord today, then you say, Lord, what do you want me to do? No longer are you in control. Lord, what do you want? And the Lord said, so two times he's attributed lordship to Jesus. They're hearing that, these Jews. And he said to me, arise, go to Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. Now, notice this word, appointed. This is a great word, and it brings up a, an important subject that we'll just, you know, touch on, and that's God's sovereignty. Jesus is the one who has divinely apprehended Paul here, and beyond that, appointed Paul for a task. And can I say this? It's the same with every one of us. God is on a mission to save, to seek and to save those who are lost, to divinely interrupt your life so that you surrender your life to him. And when you surrender your life to him, did you know he has a plan already laid out for you? He has a great plan. We're told in Jeremiah chapter one and verse five, you open up the chapters and it says to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, before you were ever born, I called you to be a prophet. Really? 
Then you read Luke chapter 1. You read about John the Baptist. And, and it's told of John the Baptist, I've appointed you to be the forerunner of the Messiah even before you were born. And we read here that Paul was appointed by the Lord to a specific calling. And here's the point. We're all sovereignly called by God. God has a plan for every single one of us. In fact, here's the wonderful thing. You give your life to Christ. You make that decision to, of your own free will to say, yes, I choose to follow Christ. And by the way, if you haven't, I'm going to give you an opportunity at the end of the service today. You make that decision to follow Christ, but then you read something that will shock you. It shocks every Christian the first time you read it after you're saved. It's Ephesians 1.4. It says this, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Hold on a second. I made a decision for Christ, but he already made that decision long before. Hold on. I, I, does, that, does that mean that I, does that abrogate my free will? I thought the only way to be saved is to exercise your faith in Christ. Yes, you do. So which is it? Am I saved because I placed my faith in Jesus Christ or am I saved because God chose me from before the foundation of the world? The answer is yes. That's, it's both. That's what makes God God. So Paul says, you've been chosen by me. I've appointed to a work. And what a glorious thing it is to make a decision and follow Christ and then to realize he has a plan for my life. And now it's like discovering that plan. What is your will, Lord? And we'll talk about that later. But continuing in verse 11, he says, and since I could not see for the glory of that light. So understand, Paul is taken off his horse and, and he is blinded. Now keep in mind, it tells us that this was high noon when this happened. So at the time when the sun was the brightest is when this bright light, even brighter than that, just blinded him and, and, he, and he's there giving his life to the Lord. What could that be? Well, it could be nothing other than the very glory of God, the very glory of Christ. If you read in Matthew chapter seven or 17, uh, P, uh, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John with him up on the mountain, and we call it the transfiguration of Jesus. He allows those three closest associates of his to see just a little glimpse of his glory. And it says when he did so, it says his face shone like the sun. Just getting a glimpse of his glory. So Paul is seeing the very glory of God. It strikes him off his horse. He's blinded. And in verse 11, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came to Damascus. Then one, Ananias, a devout man, according to the law. And again, notice he's building this bridge with this Jewish audience. You know, he's, he's a Jew, he's a devout man, loves the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there. So his whole audience is saying, hey, we like this guy, he's kosher, all right? Paul adds, this Ananias then came to me. And he stood and he said to me, brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up at him. So not only God, did God save Paul, he saved, he commits his life to Christ, but now he's supernaturally healed, he can now see again. God did an amazing work. And now he has the audience hook. Look at it. One time, this man, you know, they wanted to kill him, but now they've been listening to him. He, they've listened to him even talk about the fact that Jesus, he says, is the Messiah. He's saved me. He's healed me. So moving on from his conversion, he talks about then his commissioning. And this is what he's called me to do. Then he said, and so Ananias says to Paul, the God of your fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. So first of all, Paul, you've been given an incredible opportunity. I mean, to hear the voice of God, to be commissioned by God, amazing. But notice he says, God has chosen that you should know his will. And again, I would say that's true of all of us. God does not save us to release us back into the ocean of the world without a rudder. God has saved you for a purpose. And he's giving you ways in which you can know his will for your life. Can I give you, well, first of all, he's given you his word. So many of you are here going, I'm not so sure I know the will of God. God's commissioned me. He has a plan for me. What is it? Well, I'll tell you what, if you're not reading God's word, you won't, you won't know it. Because God has given you so many things to do and to guide you that until you're doing them, you'll never even know his will for your life. So it begins by knowing his word and reading his word regularly. And then how about communing with God, praying to him? We can now talk with God. I mean, that's amazing. I can be, Lord, what do you want me to do? Should I do this? Where, should I do that? Well, Lord, what does this mean? And he helps me to understand it as I read more, as I study more. And sometimes even communion with God is saying nothing, just being quiet before the Lord. God says, I'll reveal myself to you. I'll guide you, I'll direct you. 
And then how about being in fellowship with other Christians, being here so we grow in God's word. And I'm in fellowship with others that are on the same path I'm on and getting encouragement from them and getting insight from them. All of these collectively begin to lead me and guide me into the will of God. But if I'm not doing those things, and these are the three basic Christian aspects, then how can I ever know God's will? I don't know what God's will is for my life. I don't know what God's called me to do. But you're not doing the things that God has already told you to do, that if you're proactive in them, he'll begin to reveal himself to you. So very important. God has chosen you that you should know his will. It's the same for us. And that you should see the just one. That's a testimony and a word used to speak of the Messiah, Jesus. And to hear his voice. And he says in verse 15, for you will be his witness to all men of what you've seen and heard. I love that. The gospel is for everybody, right? God so loved the world. Your testimony, Paul, is that, that all men might know the Lord. God had told Ananias in Acts chapter nine and verse 15, Paul, I want you to go see Paul. He's a chosen vessel of mine and he's gonna bear witness of me before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. And he did. That was Paul's commissioning. But again, in one sense, it's our commissioning as well. We're called to be a witness to everybody, right? It's no different. He might have a more unique one, but we all have this commissioning. It, I have it right on the back fur down of this building right there. It says, go into all the world and preach the gospel, Mark 16, verse 15. That's the commissioning for all of us. It's not for just a select few. It's not just for me so I can be reminded, yes, I need to do that. It's for all of us. And then how about 1 John 1, 3? John writes this. The things that you have seen and heard, we declare that you could have fellowship with us. We're to do the same thing. We're to share the things that we've seen and heard. Or like the blind man said, hey, I don't know all the questions you asked, but once I was blind, now I see. God wants to share with others the things that we experience, to share our testimony, to share the gospel. So Paul was given marching orders. And Ananias says to him in verse 16, and now why are you waiting? Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So Paul has been converted. He's been healed. The next thing is, hey, now that you're saved, you gotta get water baptized. We had all these people get water baptized earlier in the service, right? He's just walking in obedience, okay. Then it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple. So first of all, the first thing that Paul does, he was in Damascus, he goes right to Jerusalem. And his intention there is to now share his faith, to start doing it. Notice also it tells us that he was in the temple. Now that might seem strange at first because wait a second, yes, he's Jewish, but now he's a Christian. Shouldn't he be going to church? Well, understand the early church didn't have buildings. It just gotten started. And we also mentioned before, it's a good place to mention it, that the book of Acts is a transitionary book. It takes place over 30 years. And so during that period of time, we're now transitioning from Old Testament to New Testament. So Jewish people would still be doing some of the things they had done in the past. Paul would go into the temple at the time of prayer, but he would use that time then to witness and to share with other people. That was his intent. But as he's there praying, notice it says, I was in a trance. So somehow God put him in this trance, very similar to what we read in Acts chapter 10. When uh, Peter went on the rooftop, he was in a trance and he got a vision from God. Same thing. Paul's there and he receives this vision. It was a vision from Jesus. Verse 18, I saw him saying to me, make haste, Paul, get out of Jerusalem. He just got in Jerusalem. No, leave Jerusalem quickly for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. Now this was probably a tough pill for Paul to swallow. He's Jewish. He writes in the book of Romans, my heart's desire is that the, that the Jewish people be saved, my brother. He, my heart cries out for them, he says. I mean, he loved his people. He wants to see them converted. When he would start churches throughout Asia Minor, he would first go to the synagogue, pray, uh, share with the Jew first, right? Then go to the Gentile. And so right at the beginning, he thought, well, this is my calling. I go to Jerusalem. I, I was a former Pharisee, and now I'm gonna share Christ. But Jesus says, no, they're not gonna receive you. Get out. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing me. Hey, I've got a great testimony here, Lord. I need to stay here. I need to stay here and share my faith. This is really gonna work. Now, I just want you to know what Paul is doing right here. He's actually arguing with Jesus. That's what he's doing. Jesus says, I want you to go. He said, no, no, I think it'd be good. They know me. I, that's gonna be powerful, Lord. He said, I can't believe that Paul would argue with Jesus. Well, how many times do you argue with the Lord? 
Uh, you, you now, you may not do it, you know, verbally, but you do it. You're reading something in God's word and, God's, and it convicts you. I, I, oh, I, I shouldn't be doing that. And you, oh, I, I don't think I read that. I didn't read that. <clears throat> Try to ignore it. We'll read something else tomorrow. And you know God is speaking to you, but you're, you're pushing back. I don't want to do that. Or it could be that God puts on your heart. You've been seeing your neighbor lately and God is saying, I want you to go share your faith with him. Oh no, Lord, I, you know, I don't know what to say. I've heard that so many times. We never know what to say. That's the number one. I don't know what to say. Just share what you do know, right, my friend? Share what you do know. Just love enough, share what you do know. But God tells you to, and you, you come up with excuses. Well, I, I'm not very good when I speak. Moses used that one. I can't help. And we come up with all the excuses, right? Or it could be even something so radical as God is saying to you, hey, I want you to quit your job. I want you to move. I'll provide another one. You're gonna have to step out in faith, but quit. Because maybe there's temptation going on there. Or maybe they're doing things that aren't right, moral, ethical, and you know that, and God's calling you to go. That's a hard one. Oh, I don't want... So there are times, listen, when God speaks to us, and we're putting up arguments, right? By the way, it's never good to argue with God. He's always going to win. <laughs> I've kind of learned, okay, i just go with you, Lord, because it's just gonna, I'm going to get there faster than going all through all the, you know, the discipline and everything else. Just do what God says. But Paul's arguing, but as he's arguing, I love this, he throws the arm, and notice what the Lord says in verse 21. Then he said to me, depart. Now, this, I don't know how you read it, but I read it like this. Hey, I want you to leave Jerusalem. Well, Lord, I got to depart. I kind of get it like that because that's kind of how it works in our Hint family. Maybe it does in your home, you know. I, I was thinking about when my kids were younger, uh, when they were like five and six years old, and they were starting school, at kindergarten, first grade. And, and every morning it was the same. I tell my, I hear my wife, Yanni, tell them, now do this, do this. But for some reason, they, there was a period of time they didn't like to brush their teeth. Now, I love the fact they love to brush it now. They're older, yes, you know, but they were younger. So they come up with all the excuses. Well, I got to do my hair. I got to still get my And every morning was the same thing. And I can hear my wife after hearing say, brush your teeth, right? Or sometimes she say, I'm getting tired. Would you just tell me? Yes, brush your teeth. I'm yelling them upstairs. That's real family life, right? I think that's something like here. It's like Paul saying, well, I can do this. And Jesus says, depart. Enough. Enough. Okay. And he says, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Now, again, Paul assumes he'd be going to the Jews. And again, Paul had opportunities every time, but ultimately he was the apostle to the Gentiles. So we see he had great commitment. We see his conversion. We see his commissioning, what Jesus called him to do. But this does lead to more conflict in the latter verses. Verse 22, and they listened to him until this word. What word is that? Gentile. I mean, Paul has clearly articulated the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. They've listened to him. He's been able to share so much, but as soon as they hear that word Gentile, they go ballistic. And they raise their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth. This guy needs to go, for he is not fit to live. They tried to kill him, now they just kill the guy. Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust in there, can you imagine? And they're just like ripping their clothes, ah, kill them. And they're getting on the ground, they're taking dust and they're throwing it up in the air. I mean, this is a crazy scene, right? But that's how Middle Eastern people are, man. They're very passionate. And this is what they're doing. They reject his testimony. By the way, this shows us as courageous as, as Paul was to do this to this crowd. And he was, this was a, this was a courageous move. But he, he loved to share his faith. But it does show us that even though you share your faith, that does not mean that every single time people are gonna get saved. Here's one of the greatest communicators of the gospel and they reject him. Does that mean he shouldn't share his faith anymore? Of course not. Does that mean that we shouldn't share our faith? Of course not. Not everybody's gonna accept the first time, second time, third, then when we share our faith. Every time I share or have an altar call, that doesn't mean every single time people come to the Lord, I make it available. And that's what we need to do. And sometimes when we're sharing our faith, we need to understand, maybe we're just planting the first seed that they've ever heard of the gospel. Or maybe we're watering the seed that someone had planted years ago and it makes them think, oh, you know, you never know how God uses that in someone's life. So we never wanna stop sharing our faith. So Paul is courageously sharing his faith. They reject it, they go ballistic, they wanna kill him. Verse 24, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging so they might know why they shouted so against him. Now, scourging was the Romans' way of exacting information. 
They start whipping them, and then, you know, if you start talking, then they stop it. If you don't, they'll just keep going, you know. So the commander's intention is to have them whipped in order that they find out what's going on. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, um, hey, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? So at this point, Paul pulls out his trump card, you know, oh, I just want you to know I'm a Roman citizen. Ooh. And when the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander saying, take care what you do, for this man is a Roman, which in the Greek means, yikes, we're in trouble. I mean, it's against the Roman law, listen, not only to scourge a Roman citizen, but to bind him without even having a trial. They've already bound him. They, they were intending on scourging him. Then the commander came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman? Paul said, yes. The commander said, well, the large sum I obtained this citizenship. And Paul said, I was born a Roman. Now, what's this about purchasing your citizenship? Well, uh, Rome, of course, was always taking on a new territory at this time, Claudius Caesar. Uh, their, their war machine was taking over more countries to put under their vassal rule. But in order to fuel that, um, they needed more money. And so they did offer up during this time citizenship for sale to those nations that they had taken control of. So here, here's a man who worked his way to be a commander in the army, and he purchased his citizenship. But Paul says, I was born a Roman. Then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him. Oh boy, we better watch what we're doing. And the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was Roman and because he had even bound him. I mean, that was wrong to do that. So Paul was spared um, even the scourging, of course. But Paul was in for a long drawn out trial because this would eventually lead to him going all the way to Rome and standing before Caesar, which of course was God's plan. Um, but nonetheless, this commander needs to get down to the bottom. What is going on? So verse 30, the next day. Because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews, he released him from his bond, so he's no longer chained, and uh, he commanded the chief priests and their council, the Sanhedrin, to appear, and they brought Paul down and set him before them. So Paul is gonna have another opportunity, which is great, he's looking forward to, to share the gospel with, with the Romans, and not only that, the Sanhedrin and anybody else they invite. It's great. And again, uh, he gives them this incredible presentation of the gospel. However, we're out of time. So this happened last week. We're going to cut off here. We've got another chapter. We're going to cover it next week. But listen, as we wind up our time, I, I just want to encourage you to be courageous in sharing your faith, number one. And, and I, I want to remind you, this is what we're about as a church. I'm going to close this morning by sharing a story. I've shared this before, and, uh, but it's so good. It's a true story, and, uh, and it's something that even happens. Think, keep in mind of how it can even happen to the church. On a dangerous eastern sea course, coast, so we're talking about the eastern coast, shipwrecks are frequent. A crew to the life-saving station years ago was built, and just a little hut, and they only had one boat, but a few devoted crewmen kept a constant watch over the sea. With no other thought for themselves, they would go out day or night tirelessly searching for any might need their help. And many lives were saved by their devoted efforts. And after a while, the station became famous. Some of those who became saved, as well as others in the surrounding area, wanted to become part of this work. They gave their time and money for its support. New boats were bought. Additional crews were trained. And the station began to grow. Some members became unhappy that the building was so crude. They felt a larger, nicer place would be more appropriate as the first refuge from those that get saved from the sea. So they replaced the emergency cots with hospital beds and put in better furniture and they enlarged the building. And soon the station became a popular gathering place for its members to discuss work. And they continued to remodel and decorate the station so that after a period of time, it took on the character of a club. Fewer members were interested in going out on life-saving stations, on uh, missions, I should say. <clears throat> so they actually hired professional crews to do the work on their behalf. The life-saving motif was still prevailing on the club's emblems and stationery, and there was a symbolic liturgical lifeboat in the main hall where they held uh, initiations for members. <clears throat> but one day, a large ship was wrecked off the coast. The hired crews were uh, bought uh, brought in, and they took in loads of cold, wet, half-drowned people. The people were dirty, they were bruised, many were sick, 
and the beautiful club got terribly messed up. So the property committee immediately had a shower house built on the outside of the club so that shipwrecked victims could get cleaned up before they ever come inside. At the next meeting, there was a split now in membership. Most of the members wanted to stop life-saving activities altogether. It was a hindrance to the social life of the club. Some members, though, insisted on keeping life-saving station because that's what they were started to do. But those members were voted down. They were told if they wanted to save lives, they could begin their own life-saving station somewhere down the coast. And they did. However, as the years went by, the new life-saving station gradually faced the same problems and it turned into a club. And a few dedicated members started another life-saving station down the coast. History continued to repeat itself for decades. If you visit the East Coast today, you will find a number of exclusive clubs along the shore. Shipwrecks are still frequent in those waters, but many people drown. Now, I share that story because this is what happens to churches. Churches start off with being life-saving stations to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And after a period of time, they become nothing but a social club. And what a tragedy. What should be there to share the gospel, they've watered down the gospel. They don't even share the gospel. They become a club and they become very, very worldly. So I just want to remind you what we're all about, ladies and gentlemen. This is a life-saving station for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? We will continue to do that. We won't stop doing that. So that's what we do collectively. But listen, that's what God calls us to do individually. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. It's not that you should be the light or you should try to be the light. No, you are. You are his light. When you give your life to the light of God comes into your life. The Holy Spirit takes possession of it. You are the light of the world. The question is, how bright are you shining? God wants us to shine. And then finally, let me say this. As we close this morning, how could I not come to a passage like this and make an invitation available to you? So if you're here this morning and you've never asked Jesus in your life, listen, the waters are troubling out there. Not just troubling, they're disastrous, but you can have relief. Jesus said you can have rest for your soul. Come to me, all of you who are laboring and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Rest comes through faith in Jesus Christ. So Jesus said, if you call upon me, you'll be saved. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, Romans 10, 9, and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, you'll be saved. It's a matter of you taking that step of faith, saying, Lord, I need you. I believe you died on the cross for sins. You rose from the dead, and now... I want to turn to you. I want to leave my past behind. I want new life in Christ. I want you to take the wheel. Like Paul said, Lord, what do you want me to do? That's where it begins. If that's where you're at, you want to be in that place of surrender. Lord, what do you want? Then we're going to close. And I want to give you an opportunity. I'm going to ask you to come forward. You've never never given your life to Christ. Then come forward. You know, we saw the testimony of many here. Many of these people came to Christ here at our church. They came forward, the same thing I'm asking you to do. They said, Lord, come into my life. I want to live for you. And their life has been forever changed. If you need a new life, which you do, it only begins in Christ, I would encourage you to come forward. Or if you've given your life to Christ, but you have drifted away from him, then I would encourage you to make a recommitment to him this morning. So will you bow with me in prayer?